what is the purpose of a victim impact statement? And is the desired outcome for victims transferable or applicable to contexts outside of the justice system? I've been researching victim impact statements to decide if it's worth bothering to write one for the impending sentencing hearing of my attacker. Will it make a difference? I came across a research paper on the uh, Government of Canada website about the perceptions of victim impact statements. And under the subheading, it's important to avoid creating expectations that can't be fulfilled. There's an interesting reference here where it says, it's very important that victims understand the essentially communicative rather than instrumental nature of the regime. And this line refers to a footnote here that reads, this perspective is also referred to as expressive or therapeutic in nature. In the summary of research findings under the subheading perceptions of what victim impact statements are supposed to do, there's a sentence that reads, some participants reported a cathartic effect from preparing their statements in having to thoroughly review and list the impacts of the crime. They felt that they were better able to put some issues behind them and get on with their lives. In a previous video, I talked about the expressive writing technique for emotional healing and that expressive writing falls under the umbrella of expressive therapy or using creative activities to help us process difficult feelings. I also shared how writing about the search and rescue and the hospital and trial experience related to my attack helped me to get some closure because I was able to organize my thoughts and feelings and it gave me a better understanding of events. In psychology terms, expressive writing allows for what is called habituation and extinction. You might have heard those terms before. The process of labeling, structuring, and organizing the details of a distressing event can help to weaken negative responses to the thoughts we have surrounding trauma. And it also frees up headspace for healthier thought processes. So do victim impact statements make a difference? Well, they may not make a difference to the sentencing outcomes or to the remorse of the person on trial, but they can certainly make a difference to the mental health of victims. Based on the research study posted on the government website, it would appear that the real purpose of writing a victim impact statement is catharsis for the victim. I've often thought that victim is a problematic word. The label of victim is assigned to people on the receiving end of violence and crime. If you are unfortunate enough to have to navigate your way through the justice system, on legal papers and in legal proceedings, you're identified as the victim. You're assigned a victim witness assistance worker because you're a victim. Most communities have victim services organizations to help you as a victim. You have the option to complete a victim impact statement as the victim. Everyone is allowed to call you a victim except you. <laughs> Claiming victimhood is often frowned upon. Some argue that we live in a culture of victimhood, publicizing every microaggression on social media. That playing the victim or casting ourselves as the victim places us on center stage, assuming a dramatic and self-important role. So while being a victim is often associated with vulnerability, helplessness, and sympathy, it is also associated with self-centeredness, manipulation, and blame. In one speech I gave back in November of 2020, I shared, so often women who experience violence blame themselves Perhaps this is a way to regain a sense of control over confusing and traumatic events. And sadly, often women become victims of blame by others who are looking to make sense of the unthinkable. We all want to know the why to the what. It's no wonder that victims often prefer to be called survivors, a term associated with strength and resilience. Even if the last thing we feel is strong and resilient, Prizes are not given out for admitting you feel angry or sad or defeated, right? 
Attention and praise often goes to those deemed resilient, the survivors. Whether you identify as a victim, a survivor, or both, depending on the day you're having, finding the courage to speak up about harm that's been done to you not only expresses your agency, but is an acknowledgement of your value. Your voice matters and it can make a difference to others. Within the context of the justice system, referring to yourself as a victim and writing a victim impact statement are acceptable and expected. But how can you write a victim impact statement outside the context of the justice system? How can we achieve habituation and extinction of distressing thoughts related to other kinds of victimization? And how can you use your voice to make a difference to others? In Kate Mann's book, Down Girl, she talks about being a victim in terms of being morally wronged or being injured, humiliated, or wounded and having your social position lowered. Outside of a criminal context, one way that people are morally wronged is through emotional abuse. In a video I posted a few years ago, I shared that I have spent more time mentally processing the abandonment of my father and other family members from religious shunning than I have spent time processing my attack, that I've thought more about the emotional abuse from being shunned than I have about the physical abuse from being attacked. So what exactly is religious shunning? Religious shunning is characterized as complete withdrawal of social and spiritual contact with former believers, including your family. So research on religious shunning has looked at select fundamentalist groups like ultra-Orthodox Jews, Muslims, Mormons, and the Amish, and it looks at the detrimental effects on people's identity and well-being. And I recently came across a very interesting YouTube channel that talks about the fundamentalist practices of the groups I just mentioned. The founders of this channel, I think, are former Mormons, and but they interview people from different fundamentalist groups of new religious movements or, or cults, another name for cults. Um, so we've got Mormons, especially polygamy, uh, victims of polygamy, Amish, we have uh, radical Islam unveiled, which is really fascinating. And then just various, various groups, like even dealing with pyramid scheme type cults, a Scientology. And there's also videos with former Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, there's also a growing body of research from the United States, England, Italy, and Australia on the practice of shunning by Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses are described as a world-rejecting, high-cost religion. And members of Jehovah's Witness religion, like what I used to be, who decide to leave the faith, like I did, are not to be spoken to, contacted, or otherwise engaged with by former Jehovah's Witnesses, including family members. And what this results in is ostracism akin to social death. That's what one of the research articles shared. So although I was shunned before my attack, I'd been shunned for about 20 years up until that point. Once I was attacked, my father reappeared in my life and showed me love and concern. It was kind of what you'd expect from a father. But then after a couple of months, perhaps because I wasn't expressing any desire to return to the religion, I don't know, um, he disappeared again. So it's almost like I had a band-aid ripped off or a scar reopened. I mentioned the term social death. So speaking metaphorically about the grieving process of their own social death, one research participant said in one of the articles that I read, imagine being on a plane with all of your family and friends and then the plane crashes and only you survive and all your family and friends are dead, but you survived. But they're not dead, they have dumped you. So a lot of the articles that I read, they explore what it's like to be affiliated with a high control religious group. And they talk about how often members experience subjective depersonalization. They lose their individual identity and self-awareness. 
And what ends up happening is that members internalize rules and beliefs and the worldview. And this new, this worldview that they internalize, it reshapes their identity to fit a rigid mold. Um, and that rigid mold often takes precedence over uh, people in your life, including family ties. It's especially precarious for women. Women that break the rules um, often find themselves silenced by shunning. Uh, one of the research participants in one of the articles I read said, I was disfellowshipped for exposing domestic violence. This resulted in reactive psychosis and hospitalization. One of the unwritten rules of the Jehovah's Witness religion is to not bring reproach upon the religion by contacting the police. So because she did that, it caused her to be silenced by shunning. Um, another research participant that I read about was silenced by shunning after raising awareness about the Australian Royal Commission investigation into childhood sexual abuse that involves many Jehovah's Witnesses over the years. Instead of being able to help others in her community to learn of this atrocity, instead she was silenced for apostasy. One of the issues that's frequently brought up in the research on religious shunning is the need for exiting members to establish a new social identity. And this can really present a challenge for people that are feeling socially isolated, depressed, having panic attacks, sometimes suicidal thoughts, they lose their self-esteem, they feel shame, they feel guilt. The literature offers insights into the coping strategies used by former members of cults um, while navigating their way to these new social identities that they've been forced to create. So many women uh, join support groups online that gave them validation, the ability to connect with others and the opportunity to form new friendships. And related to post-traumatic growth, one woman started her own online support group, another woman started writing books, another pursued studies in psychotherapy, and other women pursued a variety of post-secondary degrees. What's interesting is that many of the people that participated in these research studies mentioned the catharsis they experienced through telling their stories. I mentioned the umbrella term expressive therapies and really anytime you're able to express yourself, whether that is uh, through talking, sharing with people, whether it's through writing, whether it's through music, dance, whatever, any kind of creative endeavor, um, it gives you a cathartic feeling. It gives you, it has therapeutic benefits. And often what it does is give people a voice. They, they feel heard and validated and it helps them to make meaning of distressing events. Another way that women are making meaning of their victimization and sharing its impact is through writing memoirs. In a previous video, I shared that former Jehovah's Witness women have written more memoirs than any other new religious movement or cult, um, with former Scientologists and polygamy practicing Mormons in second and third spot in terms of the numbers of memoirs. In Kate Mann's book, Down Girl, she describes the act of coming forward. So let's say coming forward about your victimization. And I'll just share the quote here. Uh, she says, coming forward can be an expression of agency or an act of subversion um, insofar as it wrestles the moral narrative away from the dominant and default versions and make, makes one's situation salient to those who would otherwise remain oblivious. So by talking about your victimization, not silencing yourself, you can help others make them aware of the situation because if we if we don't tell people they don't know if they don't know they can't help us second the second part of that quote she says third parties may sympathize or not they may in fact become more rather than less hostile and resentful but at least they will be privy to the reality of the injury or the fact of the ongoing domination. And this can matter quite properly to people who have been victimized. So even when I look at, say, that YouTube channel I just shared, Cults to Consciousness, you know, coming forward 
uh, especially say on video, you're putting yourself out there, people are seeing you talk. Um, there's, you know, two sides to it, right? You could have people that reject, reject you for coming forward. But at the same time, you have a bunch of people that want to hear what you have to say, they will benefit from your story, and they will feel heard, you give them a voice by by sharing about your own, uh, sometimes distress and victimization. When women come forward and use their voice through writing memoir, they not only expose questionable practices that the public and even policymakers may not be aware of, uh, they also help others find solace and reduce feelings of social isolation. In Kate Mann's book, it addresses this point specifically uh, where she says in one section, um, it has been argued that drawing attention to the ways in which one has been wronged as a subordinate group member may sometimes be the best and, or even the only viable way to foster solidarity with other people in a similar position. One may thus be able to get one's injuries taken seriously or at least gain the solace of having them recognized by others who are similarly vulnerable. And then she has a, a footnote on that, that one part where she says that for one thing, there can be a visceral sense of relief in knowing that you are not alone in having experiences that may be difficult to categorize, but clearly count as some kind of abuse, exploitation, or made for an intimate relationship with too great a power differential. And when you are a woman, particularly that's been shunned from a fundamentalist religious group, a new religious movement, a cult, whatever you wanna call it, this really talks to their experience, that um, power differential, um, something, a, a distress that's difficult to categorize. How do you make people understand what it's like to be completely abandoned by all your family that are supposed to show you unconditional love. It's really hard to help people understand what you're going through because it doesn't really make any sense. And it's definitely a, a form of emotional abuse. So I really appreciated this, this part by Kate Mann. So while you may never need to write a victim impact statement, I hope you never do, you may decide to write a different kind of impact statement, a memoir. If you have been a victim of religious shunning, emotional abuse, and want to write about your experience for therapeutic benefit or expressive therapy, writing a memoir becomes its own type of victim impact statement, but with the added benefit of sharing the lessons learned, insights gained, and coping strategies that could essentially help others as well. So in a future video, I will share about the therapeutic benefits of reading memoirs and reading in general, conceptualized as bibliotherapy. This was a term that first appeared around World War I, ironically, not long after the emergence of all these new religious movements that I previously mentioned, when doctors would prescribe books to soldiers uh, to cure them of their ills rather than using pills and ointments. So it's, it's a really interesting concept. In the decades that followed World War I, the concept of bibliotherapy uh, found a place in education, therapy, self-development, and reading for pleasure and catharsis. Everything old is new again, right? So stay tuned for a video about the therapeutic benefits of reading, bibliotherapy. And in the meantime, thanks for watching and be positive.